Good afternoon. I'm Jim Valentini. I'm the current dean of Columbia College, the greatest college and the greatest university and the greatest city in the world. Uh, and I'm happy to see all of you here on what is a really magnificent event. Uh, entrepreneur and entrepreneurship are words that uh, we hear a lot now and we talk about them. We may not realize they actually go back to the 18th century. Uh, and the ideas behind them are fundamental. Uh, the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter gave a definition I like the best, which is an entrepreneur is someone who's both willing and able to convert a new idea uh, or invention into a successful innovation. It's an idea uh, that meets an opportunity that's turned into an enterprise that provides something of value to us. Technological innovation is, I think, fundamentally all about the human desire for more, better, faster, easier in some way. And that innovation is all around us. Uh, we see it actually in the last two weeks at the Winter Olympics, both innovation in human performance, nutrition, training, equipment in everything. Because innovation is everywhere and the opportunity for innovation is pervasive in our lives. It is one of our goals in Columbia College to prepare every single student who graduates from the college. The opportunity, the training, the perspective, the understanding to become an innovator and an entrepreneur. We want this not only for the graduates of Columbia College, but also the graduates of the other 15 schools that comprise Columbia University. Our Entrepreneurship Office, uh, which is led by Richard Witten, Trustee Emeritus, and Chris McGarry, Tr Richard is not able to be here today, and Chris McGarry, uh, is a sign of the university's commitment to that effort to prepare all our students for lives as innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a student group that many of you, since your students are familiar with, CORE, uh, Columbia Organization of Rising Entrepreneurs, which has been very effective uh, in propelling entrepreneurship among our students. We have just recently uh, signed a lease for a co-working startup space in lower Manhattan in an area that I think now is called Silicon Alley, um, which uh, is becoming ever more prominent in our, both in New York and in, in the university. Columbia College, I think, has been successful in preparing students for lives as innovators and entrepreneurs. Among our graduates, we can count Seth Flaxman, Columbia College 07, the originator of TurboVote, Jared Hecht, Columbia College 09, the founder of GroupMe, Zach Sims, and Ryan Bubinski, Columbia College 2011, who started Code Academy, Louis Rosetto, Columbia College 71, who is the founder of Wired Magazine. The last three appear on pages of the 30-year retrospective of the Mac that's now on the uh, Apple website, and you can read about them there. Today, we're going to hear from one of the most successful, most accomplished, widest ranging, and most creative entrepreneurs that Columbia College has ever produced. Steve Perlman, Columbia College, class of 1983. He is the CEO and sole owner of Reardon Incorporated, which has, among its parts, MOVA, which is a motion capture photography company whose work you can see in the very successful and popular movie, Gravity. Women of Action Network, which is an online destination for active women. Reardon Studios, which produces feature films, music videos, and commercials in high definition. Reardon Labs, which develops media and communications technologies. He's also associated with names you will know, former companies, Iceblink Studios, On Live, Moxie Digital, Web TV, Catapult Entertainment, and probably several others that I'm actually not aware of. Today, Steve will give us not a presentation, though it is that, but it's an unveiling. It's a world premiere. We have lots of presentations at the university, but rarely do we have world premieres and unveilings, which makes today a very important, singularly important day. Um, and Steve will be talking to us about P-Cell, which is a personal cell technology, um, which is uh, based on a methodology 
Dido distributed income distributed output um, that is aimed at precisely more, better, faster, easier in all of our lives. And we're all excited to hear about this today. Steve Perlman. Well, it's great to be here. And um, when we were thinking about where we're going to unveil this thing, one of the, we, we thought, well, you know, Silicon Valley maybe, you know, maybe we'll go to um, um, some other like theater or something like that. And we decided, you know, I want to come back here, all right, because this is where I started. And uh, this is where I got very inspired and I got very, you know, uh, got that, um, that drive inside of me to go and not just uh, uh, incrementally, you know, move forward in life, but try to go and, and reach for things and fall back and not always make it but always go and keep on doing something new. And um, we actually sort of um, spilled out what we're doing here two years ago in 2011. Um, this is actually a, a slide for a presentation I did in this very room in 2011, where uh, I was asked to say, well, don't just talk about the things that you've developed so far. We'd love to hear about something that you, you're developing anew. And me and my naivete didn't think that this vid, you know, a video of that lecture would end up on the web and would go viral because people said, oh my God, you're saying you have unlimited wireless capacity? And that can't be, and it started a lot of debate and everything and discussion. I was like, okay, we really weren't quite ready to unveil this thing. But uh, Antonio Ferenza, PhD, who is a uh, principal scientist who worked with me, we decided, look, we should release a white paper all because of this lecture that I did at Columbia that at least gives people an idea that this is not just a crazy thing we're throwing out there, but here's the basics on how it works. But even that, for most people, was not enough to convince them that it was for real, all right? So um, today it is indeed an unveiling. Um, this is a commercial unveiling, and we introduced a new company, Artemis. Uh, you may have heard the term moonshot being used around, you know, for new ideas. Well, she's the goddess of the moon and the goddess, oh wait, I should ask one of you guys, right? CC, right, you know? <laughs> um, uh, the goddess of the moon, the goddess of the uh, hunt. So, you know, moonshot, seems like a good name. Actually, the main reason we decided to use it is that it, we have Artemis.com, and, uh, and the other thing is we knew this technology would be used internationally, and one of the things I've learned is when you make up a name, when you have languages like Chinese that are not phonetic, it's very difficult to represent this name. Because she's a Greek goddess, there is a representation for this name in every language in the world. Okay. These are all practical business considerations. But anyways, so, um, and we've also switched from the name um, Dido, distributed input, distributed output, which describes how it works, to P-cell, which describes what it does. It creates a personal cell. That's the value to the consumer. So again, the, the, the point of it is, to, uh, is to, to really go and release a product, and that is part of the game. You know, it's not just the hard engineering and the difficult things you do. You actually have to make something that you can communicate to other people about what is the value of the thing you created to them, all right? So before I dive in with exactly um, how the thing works, um, what I'm going to first do is show a video that we produced. And um, I can get this thing back to the beginning. Um, that gives you an overview. This video is uh, one of the great things about uh, having this incubator that I I've put together is I get to work with both incredible technologists and incredibly creative people. This video is created by the guy behind the camera right there, Eric Peltier, and it shows what you can do with um, uh, Final Cut Pro, some creativity. Smartphones, and, um, tablets, and laptops. And not sleeping. They're just the beginning of an era where smart, internet enabled devices of all kinds demand more and more mobile data at reliably fast speeds. We've added cells, improved networks, increased spectrum. But the truth is, our always-on connected world is running out of capacity. With demand for data projected to increase dramatically by 2020, the time has come for new thinking. The time has come for P-Cell technology. P-Cell is an entirely new approach to wireless designed to profoundly increase the data capacity of our finite spectrum. In an existing cellular network, each tower transmits a radio signal, forming a large cell and carefully avoiding interference with other cells. Mobile devices all share the cell's capacity, taking turns so they don't interfere with each other. This all worked great until everybody started carrying smartphones and tablets, streaming photos, music, and videos. 
Even with more spectrum and small cells, demand is far outpacing capacity, and we've hit a physics upper limit. P-cell technology turns the whole problem inside out. Instead of dodging interference, P-cell exploits interference, combining radio signals to synthesize tiny personal cells, P-cells, of wireless energy around each mobile device. So rather than hundreds of users taking turns sharing the capacity of one large cell, each user gets an unshared P-cell, giving the full wireless capacity to each user at once. It's nothing short of a revolution in wireless. Even in the biggest crowds, there is a P-cell for every user device. And no matter where you go, you've got a fast, lag-free mobile connection. Simple, discreet P-wave radios can be placed anywhere it is convenient, making cell towers a thing of the past. P-cell technology realizes the dream of ubiquitous broadband connectivity. It changes the game, making it possible for thousands of fans to share video instantly, delivering reliable video conferencing whether closing a deal on Wall Street, showing your family the lights of Times Square, or smoothly streaming an HD movie for a three-hour drive. With P-Cell technology, wireless is fast, reliable, always there. P-Cell technology from Artemis. All right. So, first of all, is that pretty good video work? All right. Thank you, Eric. All right. So let's go and dig into how this thing works, okay? So it's not sci-fi. All right. So um, first of all, let me, uh, oh, let me get this thing right. Still haven't figured out how to use a Macintosh after all these years. All right. There we go. All right. So, uh, and here it is, you know, again, the commercial introduction of it. And, these little things here we call P-waves. This is actually a model. The, the real antennas are those little guys you'll see around here that we're using for the demo. But this is a five watt unit. It's actually waterproof. You could submerge it in water. And the fins here cool it off. It's good for uh, covering an area about four or five blocks, typically, most spectrum. And I don't think there's any reason why cell tower radios have to be ugly, all right? So this is another thing. It's like, why not make them you know, architectural, interesting, you know, you know, use industrial design. The same folks that uh, worked on the uh, uh, Nike fuel, uh, um, fuel band, is that it? Um, uh, developed this. Uh, so anyways, let me tell you a little about the team. There's me, um, and it looks like I can't hold down a job. I realize that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, as the dean was saying, I have moved on from one thing to another. And uh, some things have been more successful than others. Some have been technologi technologically successful. Some have been more financially successful. That's the life of an entrepreneur. Get used to it. Um, Antonio Ferenza, uh, who's right over there in the corner, raise your hand, Antonio, has been with me for eight and a half years. I actually was introduced to him when he was getting his PhD at UT Austin. Uh, he started working for me then. Then when he got his PhD, he did the initial work for this in Austin, then came to Silicon Valley. And we developed work, uh, worked in, uh, first in Palo Alto, then San Francisco. Roger Vanderlan, who's right next to Antonio, uh, Roger has worked with me uh, on a number of projects at uh, Reardon. Uh, he, uh, together we developed the, the basic algorithm that made a low latency video possible for OnLive and also the technology for capturing faces for MOVA and so on. Uh, and then Cindy Ivers deserves mention. She's right here. All right. Uh, somehow or another, with all the crazy stuff we're doing with tiny teams that nonetheless are dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars of investment and affecting billion dollar industries, she holds the thing together with all the crazy people she has to work with. So again, I, that deserves more of a round of applause than Eric, I think. But anyways. <laughs> all right, so here's the team that uh, actually you know, brought this, what you're about to see. Uh, we're at about 12 now, three PhDs among eight engineers. OK, so what's the problem? We're out of spectrum. Right? This is not like oil, where you can kind of keep digging and find more, perhaps. And it's very hard to, to say how much is really there. No, no, we know exactly how much spectrum is there, and we know there's only a certain range of spectrum that can actually penetrate buildings and be useful for mobile, all right? The very high frequencies, for example, can't get through buildings. And this graph was actually produced by the FCC two years ago, and I started showing it to people, say, hey, guys, look, you see, demand's growing, and we're almost out of spectrum. 2013, you're going to begin to feel it, and people say, ah, that can't possibly happen. You know, I, I, you know my cable modem has been going faster every year, and DSL is faster. You know, networks always go faster. They don't get worse. Well, guess what? The FCC was right. 
2013 marked the first year where the average data rate per user dropped, and it's going to get very, very worse fast. Okay, uh, the and you know in New York it's funny <laughs> when I came here and I, I try to tell people about that it's not too difficult to explain. We actually met with a. Um, um, uh, you know, a very successful billionaire businessman uh, yesterday, and he brought two phones with him, an AT&T phone and a Verizon phone, because he had to bring in his partner into the meeting. He tried both of them, and we were in a high rise. He couldn't get either one to make a call. This is the, near Columbus Circle, okay? And he had to ask the person who was hosting us, um, would, can I use a landline phone? That's a technology that was invented in the 1800s, in case you don't know, all right? So we're back to that in the city of New York. New York is a bellwether because it's very dense here, obviously, and there's a lot of people using phones. It's the same thing uh, is happening as you see uh, Lowell McAdam, the CEO of Verizon, had to go and tell investors, had to disclose to investors that they've hit a physics upper limit. How often do you hear a CEO of a company talk about physics to investors, okay? He had no choice. He said, that's it. We can't go. We can't produce any more capacity. And um, the CFO was saying, basically, that they are unable to meet the demands in, their ma in the major markets of uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and Dallas. All right, so it's only going to get much worse. This is a report that came out just three weeks ago from Cisco that shows their estimates of what um, mobile data uh, demands are going to be. And so I think this is kind of conservative. It's, it's about 60% a year, but between 2012, two th and, uh, 2012 and 2013, it almost doubled. All right, so, and it's mostly driven by streaming video. Why? Because people are getting used to the fact that, hmm, well, look, I can watch video anywhere. It's not like the old days where everyone was watching TV, particularly younger people. They don't really think very differently between, you know, it's IP video or it's cable or what have you. So we're seeing this huge exponential growth. All right. We also have this other thing that's happening is this Internet of Things. When we begin to have devices, you know, everything from fuel bands to, uh, um, you know, uh, obviously thermostats, you, you know, heard about um, our friends over at Nest who are acquired by Google. Um, there's, you know, we have smart parking meters that I, I hate because they tell the, the uh, meter person to come just when it runs out of time, all right? So there's, so there's the good and the bad, right? <laughs> but anyways, these, the, the expectation of the Internet of Things is going to far overwhelm uh, devices for humans, all right? And so when mobile displaces, displaces Wi-Fi, it's not just the data rate that matters. We begin to think about other things. Availability, do I have it available all the time? Or do I have uh, dead zones? How consistent is it? On a Friday night when everyone is streaming Netflix, the worst you're gonna see with a cable modem or DSL is maybe it'll drop down to 50%. It never drops down to 10% and it certainly doesn't go away entirely. We expect that from mobile all the time, right? Um, latency is a very, very significant issue. A very good paper was published in 2012 by um, a scientist at Google who monitors their, um, uh, you know, their web performance, who pointed out that above two megabits a second, the biggest determinant in how long it takes for pa page load is the delay over the network, not the absolute data rate. And then, of course, reliability. You know, um, but the one last thing I'll say about reliability is we assume uh, in our generation that radio is unreliable. Prior generations did not. When you would drive around and you had a favorite FM radio station, it worked all the time, all right? There weren't dead zones, not in the coverage area. Why? Because they would broadcast as much as they want. They weren't worrying about avoiding interference, as we'll get into in just a minute, as our cellular system does, okay? So wireless can inherently be as reliable as wireline. So the only way that they've figured out how to increase capacity of our wireless systems has been going to smaller cells, all right? Um, a macrocell is the kind of cell you might have in a rural area, which is pretty big, or on a highway when you're going a long way. Microcells are the kind of things we have in New York City, in San Francisco. Picocells are this thing in between. Um, uh, small cells um, might be, uh, sometimes small cells serve that size in area. And you may have heard of femtocells. So if you have really bad coverage in your home or your apartment, they, you can get a femtocell that will cover a very small area. So the idea of making smaller cells is that you have less people sharing the same amount of spectrum because everyone in one cell has to share that spectrum and there's an upper limit for the capacity in the cell, okay? But the problem is when the cells get smaller, you have major issues. You have issues with intercell interference. It's a very, very big one. For example, if you have a cell that's right outside on a lamppost, for it to have enough power to penetrate the walls of a building, that power down the street is going to run into the next cell and interfere with it. When you have cells interfering, it's the same thing as a dead zone, all right? Um, you also have this thing called handoff. When you are, are moving from one cell to another, 
there's a handoff that happens where uh, there's a huge amount of spectrum used to go and communicate between the cells that this person's now going to be handled by the other cell. So that doesn't happen very often with the big cells. It happens all the time with the small cells, and it's overwhelming them. So they found that they really don't get a, a significant capacity increase. Then you have all these costs. Zoning permits, backhaul is, the, is uh, bringing in fiber you know, for the data connections, power, and, and cost, and so on. All right, so what's the solution? Finally, we're getting to P cells. In this case, instead of being tower-centric cells, we are user-centric cells. We are you, the user, or your, user, your device is what we're going to support, and we're doing it by creating synthetic cells. Now, at Columbia Engineering School, if you're taking an electrical engineering class, you're going to learn that this is idealized cellular coverage. It looks like if you're at a big flat area in Kansas, no obstacles, this is what you do. You have it set up in a honeycomb grid. Well, in the real world, you never get to do that. Um, you have buildings, you can't always get the cells located where you want to, you can't always get the backhaul to where you want to, et cetera. So you end up with kind of a mishmash that you have in the center. And you notice that there's some dead zones, and you say, well, why can't they just make some of the cells bigger to cover up that dead zone? Well, if they did, it would interfere with some of the other cells nearby. So it's a matter of a balancing act that they have to do, and they try to aim them and so forth. Um, the other thing you, you can see is that uh, some cells are, um, are interfering with other cells no matter what you do. They just had to put them in there because there's an important area they have to have coverage. Now, if you look at P cell coverage, it's completely different. We haven't tried to approximate a honeycomb grid at all. Our little stations, these guys here, what we call P waves, are put wherever it is convenient. We call it serendipitous deployment. For example, where it's not ugly to have them, where it's inexpensive to locate them, and where there's a way to have backhaul that's very cheap. We'll talk about it in a second. Now, notice the transition from this slide to the next. I'm going to show you where the users are and what the signal quality is. So these red dots are users. Now, if you notice with a cellular system, the coverage equals the signal quality. See how it's denser, darker, you know, near the center, and then it gets weaker near the edge? Um, but with P cells, the coverage has nothing to do with the signal quality. Because what happens is these overlapping signals, we constructively interfere them to synthesize a cell, typically about a centimeter in diameter, around the device. So as the device moves around, if I uh, was more skilled at making presentations, I'd have a little meandering around, little red dots. The cell moves with them. All right. And what we have then is always a high performance for every device. Now in the cellular world, you know, you got some unlucky folks who are in the, uh, the dead zones. We've all been there before and not, and not very happy. We have some people that are right in the center of a cell that's not very busy. Great for you. But maybe you're in the center of a cell and, it's, uh, and there's a lot of people there. It's Times Square. And then you have poor service because of too many people sharing it. OK, so if we look, so as you can see, we have, we, we can produce with the same number, of same number of radios, a much higher performance system. So then the other thing is an economic question. That is, how do we go and, um, and by the way, Lynn here is going to get these iPhones started up. We have to turn, take them out of airplane mode because the demo's next. <laughs> Otherwise, they connect to whatever cellular stuff is going on. And, uh, but anyways, uh, getting back to this. The other thing that we have to think about is a practical consideration of backhaul. As you start having a lot of different things around there, how do you bring the internet to them? Now, with cellular, because you don't usually have much of a choice in where you put things, the, the backhaul is typically fiber. Fiber is expensive. You, you often have to trench streets in order to get it to a location. And then after that, you usually have to pay an ongoing fee on a monthly basis. So you like, if you can, to use line of sight backhaul. Line of sight radios are the, these dish radios that have a, a pencil thin beam. Um, and that communication link, so you pay for the radio once. For example, a gigabit radio is about $1,500, all right? Uh, and you pay for it once. It's using unlicensed spectrum, so the spectrum is free. And that's it. You don't have ongoing costs. Now, you can't usually do that with cellular. But with P-cell, what we do is we plan that way. In other words, we choose locations which have line of sight backhaul. And we have a landlord or another situation where it's, it's convenient for us. Um, and this is not just a theoretical proposition. We have a, a partner that we're friends with in San Francisco that has a business where they provide um, service to buildings around San Francisco. And they choose buildings, choose buildings serendipitously. They go and choose buildings which has the following condition. It has a line of sight shot to one of the buildings they already have something on the roof of. And the landlord or the building association will allow them to use that rooftop for free. If those two, two conditions don't exist, they just don't provide service to that, that building. All right? So they can have very, very inexpensive service. And they very successfully compete with uh, Comcast and AT&T in San Francisco. All right, so now we're going to move to a demo. And uh, this is 
uh, something that's absolutely amazing. And I can tell you <laughs> how many times I've been told that this is impossible. So it's, it's really a delight to show it working. <laughs> and um, I, you know, we keep waiting for the physics police, you know, some, some guys with uh, white coats you know, showing badges that's saying that we violate some laws of physics. Um, Um, that is true, um, and, and, um, I, and I think we, when we get to the Q&A, and we will have time for that, we can talk about the differences between those two worlds. But this is exactly, by the way, why we're here, um, and, and not presenting it, for example, to the, uh, at a press conference, because we'd like to have questions like that coming up and, and talking about the differences. But one of the things we did look at in the beginning was MIMO, and, we, uh, uh, and of course the LTE does support MIMO, but there are no LT phones that can do what we're about to show. So this is five megahertz of spectrum, which is enough spectrum to go and deliver uh, HD video to one of these devices. In other words, uh, if you had eight phones, a, a typical LTE network, uh, the, sort of the smallest you'll find in terms of spectrum is about 20 megahertz. Otherwise, it doesn't support an interesting number of users. Not, it's not uncommon to have a 40 megahertz network, for example. So with only five megahertz of spectrum, we really can only deliver HD to one of these devices, but of course with the P-Cell technology, we're, we will be delivering HD video to all of these devices simultaneously. And the reason is, these antennas that you see around here will be constructively combining their signals so as to go and uh, create a individual private personal cell around the antenna of each of these devices. Um, the actual computation for this, by the way, is being done in two dual eight-core um, Intel motherboards running Linux. Everything we're doing here is done in software in real time. So one of the key things that we developed here also is real-time software-defined radio that actually is, uh, is creating eight simultaneous um, cells. Each of these phones thinks that it is in its own cell and that there are no other users in that cell. And each of them, as you see very happily, um, is running and is able to go and stream HD video at once. Right? And so if you were to combine eight HD streams and try to deliver it through five megahertz of spectrum, um, it just couldn't be done. And, and speaking about MIMO, for example, uh, eight by eight MIMO can be done in a laboratory, but it's not something that's ever been done in the, in the outside world. And then you'd need. Well, that's true, but. Uh, um, uh, I'll get you a Fontana chip that can do it just fine. Well, okay, so um, uh, MIMO is a technology. We'll go and talk about that after this. And this is exactly, as I said, the sort of discussion we'd like to have. Um, these phones are not doing any processing internally. They only are, are receiving a signal as if it were what's called a SISO signal, an individual signal. Essentially, each of these devices is acting like a digital walkie-talkie. And we are simultaneously streaming eight streams uh, to antennas that are so close together that um, I can actually go and stack them. So if I take this phone here, and by the way, uh, the reason we chose eight phones was a very, very important technical reason, and that is because Apple has five colors for the iPhone 5C and three colors for the iPhone 5S, and that way we can tell them all apart. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, but here you can see we'll take these phones and we're going to position them relative to each other so the antennas are actually within just a few millimeters of each other. And um, if I can do that without them falling down. By the way, I'm not getting any kind of a, um, um, a fee from Apple for doing this. <laughs> uh, but I will say this, it, it has been fun to go and work with these things take them out of the box, slip in our SIM card, and then get them working. And uh, again, far from it being impossible, what we're doing is, is not just practical, uh, uh, it just is transformative when you go and see what this is doing here. So now we've got it. I don't know if you can see it from the video camera. Oh, I did not put the video camera on the TV screen. All right, see, I'm not doing my job. That's why Eric does the video editing and I work on the technology. But let me move over to here, move that. And then maybe Eric can shoot some of that. There we go. Okay, so 
you can see there we've got eight phones, antennas within millimeters of each other, uh, unmodified, each one thinking it's in an independent LTE cell, and all simultaneously receiving HD, t uh, HD video uh, that's streaming from them from YouTube, from Vimeo, et cetera. So th the most common kinds of things you'd like to do, we're not even trying, to, even not even talking about getting people within 50 meters of each other that have independent channels as you would in a femtocell. We're talking about people within millimeters of each other have independent channels. That's the level of density. And this will uh, happily scale uh, linearly uh, to hundreds of users. In other words, if you did have a, a system which did try to have eight simultaneous uh, streams with nearby antennas, there'd be a, a rapid drop off in terms of its throughput. And what you typically would see is, um, even with eight antennas, perhaps two, three X the performance. But here you're seeing a perfectly linear growth uh, all the way through eight, through 10, through 100, through 1,000, all right? It's a real revolution in wireless. So anyway, um, we're now going to clear off uh, the phones and uh, we're going to show you something else which is really cool, which is uh, um, I'm going to have Antonio introduce. And uh, first of all, and Antonio, by the way, will be great at answering questions later on on the technical side that go really deep if necessary. But uh, Antonio, as I said, has been working with me for eight and a half years. And uh, he had the, the foresight to recognize the potential of this uh, and also the practical uh, knowledge to go and build a real-time system which is able to go in, in, as I said, with a very, very small amount of processing power, implement simultaneously multiple cellular systems uh, and then have them all combined in space in order to deliver what we have here. So what we're going to show you next is just a really, really cool thing that goes beyond what you'd ever really think about something that you'd want to do. Um, I'm going to switch back to the laptop here. Um, using the mobile network, and that is streaming HD video, full HD streams. These are both H uh, 1080p HD monitors. Um, these actually are, <laughs> believe it or not, Dell laptops. <laughs> um, and they're uh, running Windows 8. And the reason we have to run Windows and have to run Macintosh is that nobody ever imagined that a T-Mobile LT dongle would be used for a television for streaming HD. It's just inconceivable. I mean, among other things, it'd be way too expensive. And of course, you know, uh, when you're having trouble getting your, your a reliable phone call through, be very, very difficult to be streaming an HD movie. So what we'll be showing is two 1080p streams on these two uh, devices here. And then what we have here are two 4K monitors. Now 4K, if you kind of follow the consumer electronics world, is the latest and greatest uh, uh, technology for displays. This is a 4K LG TV. They only have like one model for it. And um, it is four times the resolution of a 1080p TV. And one of the kind of the jokes at the Consumer Electronics Show was there's nothing that actually drives these things. It's above the capacity of Blu-ray players, so that this is pretty much the end of physical media. And then um, if you try to hook it up to your DSL connection, it does, DSL pretty much can't go that high, so you can't really get stream something through DSL. If you try to hook it up to cable modem, if you have a pretty fast cable modem, then you could deliver a 4K stream to this TV, or if you have fiber. So it kind of narrows the world down. So what we're going to show you is what we believe the way that 4K uh, material is going to be delivered is going to be through mobile. That's not what people expected. And um, the reason we're, we actually have 4K streams to show you is because Netflix, as you might expect, has a huge interest in this. Everything they deliver is over the net at this point. I helped Reed Hastings when they first were uh, you know, a DVD distribution system to go and start what he was doing with um, uh, streaming. And so I sent him an email, this is Silicon Valley at work, and I said, hey, this is on a weekend, and I said, hey, Reed, we've got this crazy technology. We're going to be synthesizing very small cells in space, which are going to allow us to deliver high, uh, you know, high bandwidth video to individual devices, including 4K TVs. But no one has any 4K content. I know you just shot the second season of House of Cards. Is there any chance you'd let me use some of that material? Five minutes later, I get an email back from Reed. He says, Steve, you're as insane as ever. That was how we started it. And I'm like, okay, he's not going to give it. Then I read on. He, and he had copied people in Netflix. says, get Steve whatever he needs so he can have this material to go and show off his technology. And he says, best of luck. All right? 
And that's Reed. He's just great, you know? And that's the way it works. And, and really, literally, within that day, within 24 hours, we had the only 4K material that really is available. So you're going to see um, streaming in real time. And we have to do it through a Macintosh. Now, this is the latest MacBook Pro. It's only been out for about two months because the only thing it supports 4K resolution. Um, and it's going to be driving this sharp 4K monitor there and also driving this uh, 4K TV here. And um, it will be simultaneously, as I said, uh, delivering that while we're just running uh, HD Netflix. I think uh, Antonio's already got them started up. Great. All right. And again, forgive us for this, the mechanics of this, but there is no standard devices out there. We literally have to go and uh, get a QuickTime movie started streaming and so on. And off we go. So we have that one running. I think the people that are closer to that TV and the people that are closer <coughs> to this one, you, you'll be able to see just how sharp it is. It is rather remarkable. Um, and uh, it's crazy. They have this whole season shot in 4K, the second season. They have no way to distribute it. Well, they will soon. And I think it's just insane to think that in a high-rise condo or apartment building in New York, we're going to be distributing to every different TV in that building an individual P-cell carrying a 4K stream, all sharing the same spectrum. And as I said, 10 megahertz of spectrum is a tiny amount of spectrum. I mean, it, it, nobody would even imagine um, uh, delivering LTE through just 10 megahertz. Well, with 10 megahertz of spectrum, we can light up every television in New York City with 4K resolution video. Isn't that cool? So anyways, uh, again, if you're close enough, you can see every little pore, you know, uh, the filaments of their hair, the texture of the, uh, uh, you know, the bedspreads and the, some of the scenes and so forth. It's just really, really amazing. So anyways, so uh, let me move on now. Um, um, again, we'll have more time to go and show this later. And um, if we could, um, maybe we can come and take these things down. I'll move on with the presentation. All right, so how are we doing this stuff? And uh, how does it relate to cellular? So, oh, you just go and shut it down. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so as I mentioned before, an ideal world for cellular is if you have this honeycomb layout where you basically have these antennas set up. In this case, this is kind of a uh, perspective view of antennas, three, two, three. And we want, we're showing a comparison here of MATLAB simulations of if we had a honeycomb layout, an ideal layout of antennas, flat area like Kansas, as I said, and then we add users in an ideal arrangement. In other words, a sparse arrangement of users where there's only uh, one user per cell. So even in a situation like that, and Tony, maybe we could just pull that one off. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Is it 10 bits per hertz? I'm sorry? Is it 10 bits per hertz underneath by eight? Um, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you uh, bring an eight by eight system here, set up in this room, and let's get her working on these iPhones. Um, then if that's the case, then I'll, uh, let's, let's talk to uh, 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 Greg Raleigh and ask him to go do a demo here. Um, so uh, if, I, I welcome the questions. We have good answers for all of them. Believe it. Uh, every VC in Silicon Valley has brought the top minds to go and find out why this works, but nothing else does. And um, we've, we've somehow survived all of them. Um, and somehow or another, nobody else has brought to any of the CEOs or the CTOs of any of the carriers something that runs like this. And so uh, we welcome the questions, but to the extent you're going to do, sort of arbitrarily go and say that this is trivial, we would ask you to go and back it up with something that does the same thing. Sure. Video of Nokia going around in a van, Ericsson going around in a van in Stockholm, getting real-time 800 megabits in 80 meg megahertz, i.e. So, uh, so I, let's go and uh, have that in the Q&A, because I think you're going to like the next slide, uh, this slide we're about to show in the next MATLAB simulation, because it'll show exactly what Ericsson did and why what Ericsson did will not deliver what we just delivered. This is what the MATLAB simulation looks like for this layout. Now, if you look at a cellular arrangement, which is the kind of thing that has been used for all of the systems, every LTE system in the world is cellular. LTE and the, all the LTE advanced systems that are planned, all right, all the way through the 2020s. In a cellular system, <coughs> this is a heat map. It shows how 
we know what the data rate is um, at each of those locations in space. And you notice that around each antenna, you get what looks like a volcano. And the antenna then rises out of the volcano. And if you have your, a, a random distribution of users, as you can see, a user who is near the center of one of these things gets very good performance, but a user is near the edge of one of those things does not. And so you end up with a real very high variability. So even if you're the only user in a cellular system, you're walking through this field in Kansas, or driving a, a van through Stockholm with cells around you, you're going to find that your performance will go from nothing to terrific, all right? With a P-cell system, with the exact same layout of antennas, you see those spikes rising out of the phones? I will remove the antennas just so you can see them. What it does is it synthesizes a cell at the full performance of, the LTE, of, of what the LT phone can receive, and you get this uniform performance wherever those phones are, whether they're near the antennas or whether they're far away. So look at the huge difference we have here. And by the way, it's a little harder to explain, but if you understand a bit about conservation of energy, we are using a lot less power than the cellular system in order to achieve this. And as the phones are returning, they use less power. So your phone battery lasts a lot longer. And it doesn't have eight RF chains in it. Um, it only has one. Um, so if we look at cellular layout and clustered users, this is a more difficult situation for cellular. This would be like a stadium or Times Square. Let's start with a, an ideal arrangement of antennas again. Have the users clustered in one place. And then look at the performance. Because all the users are clustered around just a few antennas, they have to not only, they don't, not only have that variability of where they are on the volcanoes in terms of performance, but they also are sharing that spectrum together. Even though the users are clustered together, you still get near optimal performance for all of this P-cell users. Everybody is still getting the full performance, no, no matter where they are. And it doesn't really matter where the antennas are. So we thought about it and said, OK, if it doesn't matter where the antennas are, let's go and do this economic thing, which is make antennas serendipitous in their placement. Hmm. Sorry, too many um, meetings <laughs> since I came to New York. Um, Anyway, so now we need to talk about serendipitous layout. And so now with the antennas placed randomly. Now if you look at, and then we'll, we'll give, have sparse users, which is the best arrangement possible for cellular. And now you look at what happens with cellular. Cellular is a very difficult time with that. You have huge areas where there's un no coverage, where you have wide spaces. And then when you have antennas that are close to each other, this is what we see with small cells, they have to pull back their power so they don't interfere with each other. All right? And once again, you see very poor performance for cellular, even with a sparse arrangement of users. With P-cell, even with a, an arbitrary arrangement of antennas, we still get very uniform performance for all the devices. And each phone has only one RF chain. One of the things I should point out is typical cell phones today have two or three RF chains. Actually, most of them have two. Right? And they, they need it for something called diversity. Because even just carrying it around without using MIME or anything, sometimes the signal goes up or goes down through the space. And so this technology, with our technology, the phones can be made even less expensive. Because essentially what, what the P-cell technology does is it makes it an ideal channel right there where your phone antenna is. All right, so moving forward, um, this is kind of a, more of a marketing view of it. But if you had a stadium, and even if you were able to go set up antennas in this way and have such perfect spread of your, uh, of, uh, your coverage, of course, the people on the edges of the circles, best case scenario would be getting poor service. And of course, you could have you know, 1,000 people in each of those circles. With the P-cell technology, you could have thousands of people simultaneously sharing that space. And again, you will not find anywhere in the academic literature somebody speaking about 1,000 simultaneous users with one antenna devices. And you certainly will not find anyone working. Believe me, we've spoken now to, I think, every major carrier. We spoke to every major carrier in the United States every major spectrum holder, and several of the major carriers in Asia and Europe. And uh, when you see some of the announcements that will be coming, I think we're more clear <laughs> about uh, just how far along this technology is relative to what is available in the world. All right, anyways, so we did this really, really cool thing, and that is we made P-cell compatible with existing LTE phones. Now, we did all this work initially. If you look at what do we do over 10 years, the first few years were saying, all right, let's go and do something which is, not a, uh, which, is, which is not something anyone's ever done before and build radios that can support it. Then we had to go and make it efficient. I mean, how do you make something that can handle, if you were to use a conventional technology, you'd be dealing with 1,000 by 1,000 matrices. Obviously, that's not feasible to uh, compute. So we had to come up with new mathematics and new techniques for the way that we organize the system. 
And then after we got it practical, so we could run in software in real time on a practical computer, then we had to make a commercial. And I, I basically confronted the engineering team and I said, look, here's your choices. We can go to the, uh, you know, the 3GPP committee, which sets the standards for cellular. We can go to all the major carriers, and we can try to convince them to go and change what they're doing and go and adopt this technology in a new standard. And then we can go to Apple, Samsung, and everybody else to build new phones. Or we can go and do this very, very difficult engineering challenge of making a standard, out-of-the-box LTE phone work with the technology. What do you think the engineers chose? Okay. So that took more time, and there are new, very fundamental wireless inventions. For example, uh, we take advantage of something called, um, uh, we can take advantage of something called reciprocity. And reciprocity normally is used like with military equipment where they have calibrated phones, where the RF chains for the up and down are the same. You can't calibrate against consumer phones. So we invented techniques that work with completely uncalibrated RF chains, but nonetheless work uh, completely uniformly. We had to make it so the computational complexity scales linearly, so you can just keep on adding more servers to the data center rather than having to add bigger and bigger servers beyond what can be computationally tractable. So this is a system which, as you add more users, it scales linearly and, and purely in parallel. So there's a huge number of practical things that we had to overcome, and these are the challenges, because we knew that if we made it compatible with ex existing phones, suddenly that would open up everything, and it did, indeed it did. And first of all, these, we, not only can we work with existing phones, but we can work in both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. For example, in, uh, in Europe and Asia, the 900 megahertz band is a licensed band for mobile. In the Americas, it happens to be an unlicensed band, all right? You may remember 900 megahertz cordless phones. Now, normally, you can't really use that sort of spectrum for LTE because the LTE, would, the interference would cause it to drop the calls and so forth. But because the P-cell technology produces these very tall spikes, we're able to go and overcome that interference. Um, we also could do gradual P-cell deployment. Suppose that we, uh, you decide you want to cover Manhattan, and then you want to go and, uh, but you, you don't have time to, you know, you don't have the, the uh, time to go and wait till you've covered, you know, all of the eastern seaboard, for example. You can go and build out an LT system in Manhattan, and then everybody coming to Manhattan will get five bars, get an independent channel, and be able to get HD all the time. And then they go over the George Washington Bridge and they're in New Jersey. Okay, fine. We hand off to the cellular network and you get cellular service there until they go build out P-cell there. Um, it also allows us to go and have, uh, you know, people like a, a Walmart or a track phone. They're called MVNO companies. They don't own their own towers. They license uh, uh, Spectrum from, um, you know, AT&T or Verizon or Sprint or uh, T-Mobile. They can build phones which then can offer the service in certain areas and then hand over again to the cellular network. Okay. So the P waves, as we mentioned, they can be put anywhere. And this is another business consideration. And um, we also, again, talked about how make, making them look nice gives you even more options in putting them. You know, you know, when you go and you confront the uh, municipal uh, board, you're putting in interesting looking things rather than you know, things which are kind of unsightly. Um, this is the architecture of the system. You know, each of these different uh, P wave radios, it's called a cloud radio access network, or a CRAN. Each of these things has an IP connection which back hauls, or sometimes called front hauls, back to a data center. For example, for all of New York, there'd be one data center. And then we'd have either line of sight, you know, hopefully line of sight. Um, but if not, we could also use fiber if you'd like, um, you know, uh, bringing it back to the data center. In the data center, all you have are servers running Linux. And then it's all code. You innovate, you come up with better ideas, better way to do things. You do a new version of your software. This will be the first major uh, software-defined radio commercial deployment, all right, which again in itself is uh, an innovation. You know, today, any of the LT systems that are out there, they're all working off of dedicated silicon. Um, so as far as the business stuff, um, from a technology risk point of view, um, there really are no significant R&D risks uh, that remain. We've spent 10 years solving one challenge after another. And I'll tell you, there were so many times we ran into things that just seemed like the impossible obstacles to overcome. But we said, you know what? Let's go look at the problem this way or that way or this way. And we were able to overcome all of them. Um, we, by being compatible with LTE devices, we've eliminated the, the, uh, the device risk. We are entering the market with hundreds of millions of devices already deployed. I mean, how cool is that? There's never been a new generation of wireless which did not require new devices and new spectrum. You know, 3G to 4G, that's new spectrum, new devices, okay? Um, 
and we don't have spectrum risk. So, you know, spectrum costs billions of dollars. For 12-person companies, that's a little bit difficult to arrange because we can work in unlicensed spectrum. Of course, we can work with uh, carriers or spectrum holders that have licensed spectrum. And the thing that's nice also is we can go and take our time in deploying this. Uh, in this area around our office in San Francisco, there is the best LT service in the world by far. Uh, there never is any congestion, and you can watch 4K video if you'd like, all right? And we can build out from there uh, as much as we'd like uh, with our partners, you know, at a very, very fast rate with a large partner if they choose to, or hook up with some entrepreneurs who just want to cover their own cities and then switch over, hand off to the uh, cellular network through either MVNO or some other arrangement elsewhere. Or maybe they go, maybe they sell a phone that is super service in Manhattan, and you go out of Manhattan and it does Wi-Fi. That phone will be pretty much as big as an iPod, okay? I mean, what's the difference between an iPod and an iPhone? It's the LTE radio, pretty much, right? What we require in terms of the radio inside of uh, a, P, uh, a P cell system is less complexity than a Wi-Fi chip, and it's far less power than anything. Um, the radios that you're seeing here, now I'm happy to reveal, are running at one milliwatt. Okay, you just saw 4K video and two 1080p videos running at one milliwatt of transmit power, okay? To give you an idea, Wi-Fi runs at 250 milliwatts, okay? Um, so it's a real revolution in wireless, and it is, again, a phenomenon that cannot be explained through any other wireless system that's been developed before. Um, so um, it's a leapfrog of 4G. Um, 4G, 5G is at a call for paper stage. And basically what they're saying qualitatively, what they'd like is for everybody to be able to receive HD video streaming. By the 2020s, they figure everyone's going to need that. And uh, they're basically, there's a number of different proposals about how to do it. Well, we're delivering on most of the requirements for 5G in 2014 with existing devices that have been shipped, that are shipping today. All right? It's pretty cool. Um, and we can now actually make HD deliver. Now, yes, it is the case. 1080p can be practically delivered through lots of means. We just showed 4K because we like to show off a little bit, all right? But 4K is something which is not practical to deploy through any other means except through mobile using P-Cell, okay? And that's just cool. It really is, all right? Um, and it also allows us to make, and this is really neat, lower cost mobile devices. Remember I was saying about you could build an iPod type device, that's a P-Cell device, that is actually a little higher performance than LTE because it, it doesn't have all the overhead of, 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 the require, of, the, of the framing structure and so forth for dealing with handoffs, for scheduling, and so forth. So we can use the same spectrum and the same infrastructure, the P-cell infrastructure. So we work with standard LTE phones. If somebody wants a, an LTE phone, maybe they're going, you know, traveling or something, and simultaneously in a separate P-cell have a different protocol. What we've done is we've virtualized radio. Remember, if, if, for those of you familiar with virtual machines, you can have, you know, a Macintosh and Windows and Linux. Well, now you can have LTE, what we call P-cell native, and other things simultaneously running with the same P-cell controller, virtualizing radio, by isolating space into these little centimeter sized cells. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, the other thing from a business point of view is that LT is quickly becoming a commodity. It's amazing how quickly it's becoming a commodity. You have um, uh, AT&T and you have um, T-Mobile producing very similar devices. In fact, AT&T, of course, tried to acquire T-Mobile, but T-Mobile is much smaller than AT&T. But by um, you know, doing different price drops and packages, they forced AT&T to lower their prices. Why, why is that? Because they're basically selling the same thing. To a consumer, some people know the AT&T brand as bigger, but they both, both are selling the same commodity product. And in fact, in some cases, going with a smaller operator has less congestion. All right, so the first uh, deployment is uh, possible for us to do in the fourth quarter of 2014. Uh, the technology obviously works, um, and it depends on the partner. Um, <laughs> When I had this slide put together, um, we were absolutely certain that it was going to be in San Francisco, given the meetings that we've recently had in New York. I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> so uh, we may be deploying in another city first. We'll have to see. Uh, the timing really depends on, on how the partner wants to roll out, who, who we work with. And then we can do a full P-cell deployment. Um, we've already explored this with major US operators about what it would take. 
and we can be in all major markets. I mean, we won't be in secondary markets by the end of 2015, but they certainly could deploy this in all major markets by the end of 2015. And in those major markets, people will not need to have cable connections, will not need to have DSL. I mean, literally, in a year, we can displace the need for cable and DSL. That's pretty crazy, huh? All right? So it's a very exciting technology. Um, and at this point, I would like to um, say one more thing. Um, I, uh, last time I gave a talk here, I lived to regret this, but I talked about something that was not yet done. Um, and it kind of got out there and people got excited about it. So I said, all right, I got to maybe say a little bit about something new and surprise everyone here. Um, but I can't, for all sorts of reasons, tell you exactly what it is, so forgive me. But I will leave you a clue. P-cell technology is not limited to communications. Communication is a very, very important and good application for it. It's not actually the biggest one. What we are doing here, at the end of the day, is synthesizing a tiny radio wave bubble in real-time software. This opens up a universe of applications. I will leave it to your creative minds to think beyond the ones that we've thought of, but there's a lot of them, all right? And the really radical announcements are gonna freak you out. And we'll give you one hint. We showed you a sneak peek uh, in the intro video, and I'll leave it to you to figure out what it was. All right, well, thank you very much.